Welcome back to another edition of the Mintcast. I'm your host today. I'm Alan McLeod, Senior Staff Writer and Podcast Producer here at Mint Press News, uh, the website where we go behind the headlines and dive into the biggest issues of the day. If you'd like to support our work and you want to, to see more of it, you can do so by visiting our Patreon page. There's a link in the video or audio description below. Now, a recent study from the Cost of War Project at Brown University found that the United States post 9-11 wars are responsible for 4.5 million deaths worldwide. And astonishingly, at least 38 million people have been displaced as a cause of these wars. And yet the US public is really shielded from the, that reality. In fact, the realities of war are hidden almost entirely from the, Amer uh, the American public as a matter of great urgency. Here to talk to me about this today, I'm delighted to be joined by Norman Solomon. Norman is a journalist, activist, and media critic, and author of the new book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. I'm delighted to uh, be joined by you, Norman. Hey, thanks, Alan. Well, I guess my first question to kick off is that we're more than 20 years past the date of the Iraq invasion and the declaration of the war on terror. And I think it's about time that we can really start to take stock of what has happened in these past two decades. What do you think has been achieved uh, in these wars? It's interesting that you use the word declaration because in a formal sense, of course, the U.S. hasn't declared war since World War II, but it certainly was a declaration. It was a pronouncement to the world from President George W. Bush that as he said, the United States was going to actually get rid of evil, which is a sort of a stunning aspiration for a president or anyone to proclaim. It's uh, when you step back at it, it's fairly unhinged. But that was the preamble to the last 22 years, the idea that the United States would root out terrorism wherever it might exist and make the world safe for whatever. And the stats that you mentioned are significant, to put it mildly, in human terms, and also significantly, if not completely unknown, then almost unknown to the US public. So there's a dynamic of the uninformed consent of the governed, which is a perversion of the concept of democracy where the informed consent of the governed is a central tenet of making it all work, making it all real. What we're getting now is a warfare state that is extremely profitable, that uh, numbs people to the realities, or maybe precisely not so much numbed as keep them in the dark. And this is an ongoing question of how can it be made real for people who in their names and with their tax dollars are not only have been, but really are pursuing an ongoing so-called war on terror, which quite often is a war of terror. You know, a couple of decades ago in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, people around the Bush administration were talking about a project for a new American century and a new world order. And they were talking like an invading in Afghanistan or Iraq would really cement the United States position around the world. But what I see in the cold light of the 2020s is that the United States position is actually really crumbling uh, worldwide as a sort of geopolitical top dog. We're seeing uh, other countries, particularly China, challenge the United States role. And there seems to be a lot of bad feeling towards Washington around the world from so many countries who are now looking for uh, another, I don't want to say a hegemon, but some sort of counterweight to the United States. It seems, therefore, that this whole uh, war on terror has actually uh, lessened the standing of the United States worldwide. Would you agree with that? I would. Um, Raytheon, Boeing, uh, other military contractors, they never lose a war. It's always very extremely profitable, but in terms of geopolitical positioning and so forth, it's very difficult to maintain an empire in decline, which is really not a bad description of 
the United States in the last decades. And so the empire, its main leaders, does not go quietly into that night. It holds on. It tries every which way to maintain and, if possible, enhance power. And here we are in the latter part of 2023, and you can see that flailing around, which unfortunately is not ineffectual. It's still exacting an enormous human toll on people in various parts of the world, I would argue, including in Ukraine, where pouring in billions of dollars worth of weapons rather than engaging in genuine diplomacy has really subjected more people to more suffering and more death with no end in sight. And so we have the, uh, if not a superpower, a major power trying to get up off the floor from a couple of decades ago, Russia, which has inflicted on Ukraine and continues to inflict on Ukraine a tremendous crime against humanity, violation of international law, slaughter of people in Ukraine. And you have the United States, which leading NATO has helped set the stage for uh, these conditions that led to the war. And so in a real sense, I think we have the United States government and its corporate and military interests on a downslide. And when you're on a downslide, of course, you try to arrest and reverse uh, your deteriorating position. So I think that approximately is where we are now. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty young when the war on terror was declared. And what I remember it of it was just uh, the sort of chilling effects that there was uh, in media and in the public discourse right now. I remember the jingoism and the thirst for blood to be particularly disturbing. Uh, you quote in your book uh, a Gallup poll that found that as the first U.S. missiles were striking Afghanistan, a staggering 90% of the U.S. public supported the attack. And uh, I think so much of that atmosphere was influenced uh, by the media at, our, at the time. Um, a lot of viewers are probably too young to remember what that was like. So as a prominent media critic, could you give us an idea of what it was like watching television or reading the papers during that era? It was a stunning atmosphere of conformity, of lockstep, of, by any other word, declaring war on, in some respects, almost a phantom. Can you have war on a tactic, which is terrorism? Well, rhetorically, but as a practical matter, even Al-Qaeda was a so-called non-state actor. And the media, certainly of the United States, was overwhelmingly in favor of, well, killing some people in response. It was almost secondary who? Now, none of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 were Afghan. It's true that Al-Qaeda had taken refuge in that country, in Afghanistan. But as a practical matter, Afghanistan had nothing to do with the actual attack. And not only that, I believe the Taliban was relatively willing to <clears throat> uh, give up these uh, these chief architects of 9-11 if certain conditions were made. But the U.S. didn't appear to be willing to negotiate with the Taliban. And uh, the, the phrase that really resonates with me from that time is freedom fries, when you know, uh, French fries were changed to freedom fries on uh, menus across the West, especially in the uh, in the United States, because France said it would not uh, support uh, an invasion. And in fact, it would veto it at the United Nations. These sorts of uh, uh, jingoistic phrases really were just uh, pummeled out throughout the West. I remember things like the the actual the actual attack on 9-11 being played on repeat constantly, whipping people up into a near constant state of terror and foreboding. There was a lot of attacks on uh, Asians, I mean, particularly from South Asians or West Asians, people from the Middle East uh, who were living in fear in that time. And 
not only that, if, if you turned on the television, anti-war messages were pretty much absent from corporate news anyway. In fact, uh, the founder of Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, Jeff Cohen, noted in his book, Cable News Confidential, that CNN executives instructed their staff to constantly counter any images of civilian ca uh, casualties from these wars with pro-war messages, even if, and I quote, it may start sounding rote, end quote. And that's the sort of coverage that really helps push the large majority of Americans towards uh, support, uh, supporting the ground war. In fact, even three quarters of Democratic voters supported the ground war at, at some point. And journalists themselves were, who were critical of the war, found themselves sidelined or worse very quickly. And thinking about people like Chris Hedges of the New York Times, who was essentially pushed from his job as quite a senior uh, reporter there. Uh, news anchors like Phil Donahue, Jesse Ventura uh, lost their positions. Michael Moore was constantly hectored and harried wherever he went. The Dixie Chicks were the first 21st century example of a musician being properly cancelled. But uh, in your book, uh, which I repeat, it's called War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, um, I think you told the story of Ashley Banfield in particular. Could you tell uh, us what happened to that particular media um, personality? Yes, it's, it's very indicative of the atmosphere that evolved. Uh, we were talking about uh, the autumn of 2001, where it was virtually completely lockstep. And the polling reflected that only 5% of the public told the United States uh, uh, poll polling from Gallup that they opposed attacking Afghanistan. So we're talking autumn of 2001. There was a lot of uh, fear and conformity, to put it mildly. And during 2002, no argument of substance about continuing to make war in Afghanistan. And then up on the horizon was a very clear intention of the Bush administration to invade Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, as a matter of fact, Saddam Hussein's regime was quite secular and opposed to uh, groups like Al-Qaeda. And there was, of course, the fiction promulgated as fact that Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, which turned out to be a complete falsehood. There was some debate about whether to invade Iraq, but after Congress voted in October 2002 to go ahead, that debate dissipated. And then the rally around the troops dynamic, beginning with the invasion in March 2003, was um, quite much in play. So we've seen this continual uh, process of war making or a combination of reasons, I don't think we can boil it down to one, very lucrative for the military contractors, uh, part of an imperial vision of geopolitical positioning, access to raw materials. If Iraq had excelled at production of cucumbers instead of oil, unlikely the invasion would have taken place. And the war becomes its own justification. So here we are, as you mentioned, Alan, we're 22 years after 9-11, we're more than 20 years after the um, invasion of Iraq, and a less reliance on troops in battle, much less reliance on so-called boots on the ground, but a lot more reliance on air power. Not that it wasn't always important since October 2001, but proportionally bombing drones and so forth, what President Biden has fondly called over the horizon capacities, bombing and strafing and terrorizing through hovering drones, that's routine for the United States. Then we have special operations units in more than 100 countries. We have periodic air attacks in Syria or Somalia. We have training of almost every uh, government in Africa, astonishingly, perhaps in uh, the role of the Pentagon 
We have training, as Nick Terse, the great journalist, has documented recently, training of many coup leaders, overthrowing often democratically elected governments in Africa, training by the Pentagon. This is a regime in Washington with some democratic aspects, lowercase d, democratic, that um, is determined to pursue um, U.S. dominance on the planet as much as possible. Uh, Russia being one enemy um, itself, uh, or criminal uh, state called Russia. The United States also, um, in the last couple of decades, engaging in, according to the Nuremberg Tribunal, the, the ultimate, the supreme international crime of invasion and aggression. And now, not only Russia, but uh, China is in the sights of the uh, U.S. Uh, war scenarios. And I think it's notable, and I've come to mention this to folks, that the U.S. power structure, including U.S. corporate media, take great umbrage at the presence of military Chinese vessels in the South China Sea. How dare China be in the South China Sea in that way. As though it was coincidental what the middle name of the South China Sea is. And for centuries, really, the United States has proclaimed, and sometimes with aggressive war, as in Panama and elsewhere, tried to enforce something called the Monroe Doctrine. We, we run this hemisphere. But that's not enough. Any sort of sense of uh, security zone, uh, a sense of um, having uh, some insulation from vulnerability to attack for Russia or China, those uh, outlooks through the windows of the Kremlin or Chinese uh, top offices, those are seen as illegitimate by Washington. And so the idea that China, for instance, would have any security interests around its own nation, as in the South China Sea, that's them fighting words for the uh, power brokers in the military circles of Washington. So just to sort of sum up, Alan, I think that the U.S. is on a collision course with sanity around the survival of humanity in the nuclear age, ginning up rather than engaging in diplomacy over the conflict in Ukraine. And the consequences, to put it mildly, are not only horrific in the present, but potentially on the side. Most definitely, when you consider that both Russia and China have between them thousands of uh, nuclear warheads, particularly Russia, um, and as you said, we've seen buildup of tensions uh, between the US and with both Russia and China, which is, uh, again, if we go back to what I was saying about maybe the US having a strategic blunder, it seems that these two, uh, two of the largest countries in the world who didn't often have very good relations, seems that US actions are actually pushing those two nations together, which is what is a big new Brzezinski the great uh, democratic war planner, the sort of Democrats version of Henry Kissinger once said in his book, uh, The Grand Chessboard would be the absolute worst case scenario for the United States in the 21st century. And yet it still seems to be happening. The US now has a network of, depending on who you read, between 300 and 400 military bases encircling China, going from Japan and Korea in the Northeast all the way down to these uh, new bases they're building in the Philippines and Guam uh, in China's south to, and then over um, in uh, Central Asia as well. Um, still, few Americans are really aware that this buildup is happening. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, what do you think of uh, the possibility of a coming war with China? Do you think that is uh, a likely outcome or do you think that's something that the US uh, is really very keen to avoid at all costs? It's certainly a risk. I think that uh, leaders are keen to avoid um, a war with China, but also keen to not 
be perceived as backing down and also trying to consolidate uh, alliances around uh, China. The recent trip to Vietnam by Biden uh, sort of underscoring that effort. I don't know that that would be particularly successful, but what you're mentioning really speaks to, among many other things, the reality that really smart, really perceptive, and in many ways savvy leaders can do really stupid things, even on their own terms. I mean, consider the decision in early last year by Vladimir Putin to order the invasion of Ukraine. Well, I mean, speaking as someone who's been opposed to expansion of NATO for the last couple of decades, and my colleagues and I at RootsAction.org have organized and supported protests and lobbying against NATO. I have to say that it's just so terrible that what Putin chose to do was the absolute worst possible scenario for rolling back NATO. I mean, yes, the expansion of NATO, even including up to Russia's borders, was a abrogation of and violation of a pledge made when the Berlin Wall fell, pledged by the U.S., by the first President Bush administration. But the fact remains that the last thing we needed was to expand NATO further. And yet by invading, and this is what reminded me, Alan, because you look at U.S. policies having the opposite effect of keeping so-called enemies apart, bringing them together. What uh, Putin did was make it possible, make it conceivable for Finland or Sweden to join NATO, which is, I think, a, a terrible result. But um, it would have been unthinkable two or three years ago. Now it's uh, it's happening. So by the same token, the U.S. leadership, such as it is, well, they're making choices that one would think, from many vantage points, are just plain dumb. I mean, uh, as you mentioned, creating conditions where blocks are being created um, between Russia and China, now we're told North Korea, not helpful for world peace, not helpful for a geopolitical positioning of the U.S., but it's a result of the militarism, uh, in many ways, the uh, aggressive militarism that the United States has pursued. Yeah, and uh, the uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has certainly mm, led to a lot of um, actually pro-war demonstrations. There seems to be very little, uh, when I say pro-war, I mean uh, pro-confronting Russia demonstrations. Um, if you go back 20 years ago, uh, the Iraq war, as um, the philosopher and media critic Noam Chomsky says, was almost unique in American history in the sense that there were huge demonstrations against the war before the war had even started, uh, where we saw vast numbers of people out in the streets in major US, UK and other cities around the world protesting against the war. But that sort of energy really has dissipated quite a lot to the point where it feels like the anti-war movement has uh, lost its way a little bit. And I think simply keeping images of destruction of the war machine away from people is a major way in which consent for these endless conflicts is managed and manufactured. So I guess I'm asking you to explain the sort of thesis of the title of your book. How does America uh, make war invisible to Americans, because it's not really kept hidden from much of the rest of the world, is it? It's not per se hidden, it's not a secret, and yet the silences, the lack of media coverage, the behavior and language of elected officials and appointed uh, foreign policy folks in Washington, it all combines to spin a tale of illusion if in the echo chamber there's very little mention of the U.S. being at war anymore. 
the reliance on faraway technology, the way in which failure to mention victims of U.S. warfare equates in many people's minds with the people suffering from U.S. warfare don't exist. Those are just some of the ways that over time, the invisibility of U.S. wars has become more and more present. It's sort of the presence of the absence, so to speak. And not that U.S. media coverage was ever great uh, of the invasion of Afghanistan and the war there and the war in Iraq. Um, my book spelled out ways in which the coverage was always terribly deficient. But at the very least, there was awareness through media coverage and what U.S. politicians felt they had to talk about, that U.S. troops were fighting in Afghanistan, they were fighting in Iraq. They're not fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan anymore. They are fighting in Syria, they're fighting in Africa, very little media coverage of each, a lot of training, uh, drone strikes, air attacks, which has always been a favorite of the military-industrial invisibility complex, you might say. And so it's that absence, it's that silence about truth, and also the affirmative statements that are lies that combine to, all these were the first words I wrote of my book, the title, War Made Invisible, combine to make war invisible for folks in the United States who might even watch the news very carefully. When President Biden spoke to the UN General Assembly just about exactly two years ago. He was speaking just after the final withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan. And he said for the first time in 20 years, the United States is no longer at war. He said, we turned a page, which sounded really good, except that it was a complete lie. The United States was engaged in counterterrorism activities in more than 80 countries, as documented by the Cost of War Project at Brown University. As I mentioned, special operations units in more than 100 countries in a given year, and involved with uh, all kinds of airstrikes and uh, joint military actions in a number of countries. So lying doesn't seem to be a problem in that kind of context as far as U.S. mass media are concerned. I mentioned in the book that around that time, the Reuters News Service ran an article about the next U.S. proposed fiscal year federal budget. And Reuters said that it was a peacetime budget. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're very much in Orwellian territory. The United States continues to be at war while we're told it's peacetime. Yeah, and even since its inception, I believe there's only been about 20 years of uh, formal peacetime that the United States has actually enjoyed. It's been at war for something like 227 out of the 250-something years that uh, it's actually, or 40-something years that it's actually been a nation. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess the word that comes to mind uh, when you were speaking there, Norman, is uh, sanitized. Um, when we turn on the television or read reports of um, of wars, we never really see the effects of the bombs being dropped. Maybe at a push, if we watch, you know, CNN or Fox, we might see pictures of uh, smiling American troops or uh, very expensive uh, airplanes dropping bombs from who knows how many thousand feet. But we never actually see the uh, the the people who are underneath those bombs. We don't see the screaming children. We don't see the weeping mothers or the you know the limbs being separated from the bodies because there are really no Western journalists there. We don't see the devastated buildings, which actually wouldn't look too much unlike the wreckage of nine eleven. And so ultimately, Americans' view of war is just so different to the victims of U.S. aggression that it's very hard to countenance, you know, uh, for war, you know, when Americans think of war or British people or French people think of war, you know, uh, war to them is often just uh, their taxes going up rather than uh, them knowing people who have died or uh, living through trauma. Uh, 
And we only really get sneak peeks of this very often through leaks. I'm thinking specifically about something like the Collateral Murder video, which was released by Chelsea Manning, which showed uh, US uh, gunship pilots just uh, assassinating people in cold blood, including Reuters journalists, actually. Or perhaps the Abu Ghraib uh, photo torture scandal, or other leaked videos showing the barbarity of the process. And I think ultimately, that really speaks to uh, the fact that this decision by media not to show the bloody realities of war is actually a decision that they are consciously or unconsciously making every day. And if they did decide to present uh, the war in a way not too dissimilar to the way they present the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think the American public really wouldn't stand for the sorts of things uh, that their government are actually doing. And they wouldn't, they certainly wouldn't stand for the other close to war uh, like actions the US government is taking, like sanctioning uh, a quarter of the world's population, uh, resulting in 100,000 Venezuelans dying, or sending billions of dollars of arms to Saudi Arabia so that they can help kill 400,000 Yemenis in a, a quote unquote civil war. So, yeah, I think media has an absolutely extraordinary level of both power and also responsibility to present war in a much more objective way. But that is something that they simply don't do. And the small outlets that do try to do that are often suppressed or marginalized. If the wars were presented with, as you say, more objectivity or realism to the extent that media technology can do that, at least move in that direction, I think it's fair to say that there would be more opposition from the U.S. public to those wars being pursued by the U.S., how much more opposition and what the political effects would be, is, you know, it's hard, hard to tell. You're reminding me that I think I really didn't uh, address the, your reference to Ashley Banfield, because she's a case in point. She was a rising star at NBC. She covered the Afghan invasion or the aftermath of the Afghan invasion uh, the Iraq invasion. She was being touted as possibly the successor to NBC chief anchor uh, Katie Couric. So we're talking uh, spring of 2003. Her career hit a wall in one hour because she gave a speech at a campus, a college campus in Kansas, and she said, Essentially, what you were referring to a few minutes ago, Alan, that what actually happens to people in war is not the launch of the missiles, it's not the smoke and the dust. She said there's a real difference between coverage and journalism. You saw what happened when the missiles were launched, you didn't really see what happened to people when they landed. And for her candor, she was publicly disciplined by NBC management. There were news releases from NBC saying that Ms. Banfield did not mean to disparage the work of her colleagues. She will choose her words more carefully. And when she got back to Manhattan, she was escorted to a new office, which was basically a tape closet. And in terms of big media, her career was done. She was not let out of her contract, and yet she wasn't given work to do. And this was an object lesson for journalists. What happens if you step out of line when it comes to the warfare state? Yeah, I mean, you wrote in your book, I should say, uh, I think you wrote omissions. This is a direct quote. What we don't see in here might be the most pernicious messages of all. And that's really what... I think I was getting on uh, at um, before when I was talking about that. You also uh, gave a great quote. It wasn't actually from yourself. You were quoting a fellow journalist, Reese Ehrlich, who said, most journalists who get plum foreign assignments already accept the, the assumptions of empire. I didn't meet a single foreign reporter in Iraq who disagreed with the notion that the US and Britain have the right to overthrow the Iraqi government by force, end quote. And I'm sure that's Pretty much, uh, uh, pretty much the same if you change the word Iraq to Afghanistan or Syria or 
sanctions on Cuba or Venezuela or whatever you want to talk about, there's an unquestioning assumption uh, going through corporate mainstream media that uh, the United States uh, has the right to intervene and interfere in others' politics whenever it wants, and that it is a fundamentally benign force, a shining city on the hill, as Ronald Reagan loved to say. Um, I wanted to really drill down in this, because this is something that I've been looking at for a long time and ask you how you think a system like that comes about. How does corporate media become such a bastion of one-dimensional thinking? I guess Ashley Banfield is a case in point, how, uh, how examples are made of people who put their head above the parapets. But there must be other uh, ways in which this happens as well, right? Yeah, I think that's a, a great framework for a question, for exploration. We could look at it structurally, the superstructure, the corporate ownership. If you work in an organization, the people who are at the very top, they have control over the funding, who, who gets hired and fired essentially from the top down. And so the ownership of these media outlets is tremendously important, plus the advertising dynamics who and what sources are uh, fueling the, uh, the income of the institution. And so these are, these are extremely dominant, uh, huge so-called legacy, in some cases, media outlets. And they have often billions of dollars in assets. So it's an ownership issue, and it's uh, almost an oxymoron to think that a huge corporation is going to be progressive. They, the nature of the beast, the, the legal requirement of the board is to enhance profits as much as possible. It's for a voracious profit machine, nature of corporate capitalism. And so poor people, they're not on the agenda. Healthcare, education, housing, uh, they're not on the agenda other than Profits, and we don't want to be uh, sort of mechanistic about this. There are more liberal or conservative corporations, as there are more liberal or conservative and large media outlets. But these are structural constraints. These media outlets, a CNN or a New York Times, they have an internal political economy that requires that they interlock with sometimes their board directors, but more fundamentally in terms of how they function, their lifeblood of the, the flow of the financial nutrients, it's about profits. And so if there are poor people in Africa who are going to suffer from U.S. military intervention of some sort, but there's extraction of raw materials at a low price from the miners, I mean, the priorities are usually fairly automatic for these corporations. Again, it's not a super mechanistic thing. There are contradictions. There are various, um, if you will, ideological personalities of various media outlets. But that's, that's the overhang. That's the uh, roof uh, which exercises some constraints from the top down. It's not that important, really, what individual reporters personally think. It, it can matter. But they're not that different from hamburger flippers at McDonald's. They don't make policy. And if they step out of line, and we have the examples, such as Ashley Banfield, they're going to suffer consequences, or they will see that other people are suffering consequences, and it helps keep them in line. So that's, I think, another key aspect. You have the, the top-down ownership, advertising, uh, profit-taking, fixations of the institution as a whole, the sort of raison d'etre. And then you have the experience of the individuals who work within those institutions. And if they step out of line they, in the United States, they're not going to be taken from their home, and imprisoned or shot, like in some dictatorship. Um, they just might find that they can't pay their mortgage anymore because they've lost their job or their career has not advanced. And this, I think the word insidious really applies. This is the way it all functions. Yeah, what you're describing is that these media institutions are not these uh, you know, progressive 
bastions of uh, expressive thought, what we might think, but they're actually very much top-down authoritarian institutions. And another thing that's happened over the last few decades is that increasingly uh, uppercase J journalists um, are really products of the Ivy League or other elite schools. There's a recent study that found that a higher percentage of journalists at the New York Times and other top outlets attended Ivy League universities or the equivalent. Uh, more journalists than senators or even billionaires went to uh, these sorts of Ivy League schools. And these institutions, I think, instruct you in a very certain way, uh, these elite journalism classes, which often cost up to, say, $100,000 per year to attend, um, these will really instruct you in a very certain form of journalism. And when you graduate with that amount of debt, there's really, you know, there's really on what, only one way of paying that back, and that is by not rocking the boat. And so I guess if you enter a, a profession like journalism, where there's very little job security at all, there's only really one way to make sure that you're going to stay being hired and you won't lose your job. And that's certainly to please the people above you. And as you said, there are plenty of examples of people uh, being anti-war, being forced out of this uh, profession, but also on other issues, this can happen as well. I remember Mark Lamont Hill was fired from CNN for expressing support for uh, free Palestine. Uh, so there becomes this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy and the self-perpetuation of uh, self-censorship and huge conformity to the point where somebody like Brian Williams, the MSNBC anchor, can in 2017 watch a US missile strike on Syria and almost cry with joy. He said, I remember he said, I'm tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen, I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons, he said, as the US launched a clearly illegal attack on Syria, which killed God knows how many people and now the U.S. is uh, occupying, if reports are to believe, one third of the Syrian landmass, and you know, this sorts of consequences for the Syrian people uh, can only really be dreamed of, you know, in terms of how negative that is. Um, but yeah, I did want to contrast the uh, presentation of the U.S. Uh, war machine with uh, that of Russia. We've seen. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has been front and center of U.S. media coverage, uh, leading to massive sympathy, in fact, for the Ukrainian people uh, in the West, anyway. Uh, on the one hand, I think the Ukrainian flag being displayed by so many people in their homes and businesses is quite a, a lovely gesture of solidarity. But on the other, I can't help feeling quite mm, perturbed by this as well, specifically because there's such a lack of... Uh, Yemeni flags, Libyan flags, Iraqi flags, or the flags of any number of uh, the victims of uh, US policy. And so one thing I've been thinking quite a lot about recently is how corporate media really um, uses people's natural empathy against each other, against them, driving us to support wars and conflicts that the US wants by showing us images of suffering when it is um, expedient for uh, the US military or Washington in general uh, for us to see them. Uh, do you think if we saw the victims of US crimes as much as we saw our enemies, uh, our, our enemies' victims, uh, what sort of effect would that have on American society? It would have some effect. Um, the framework of uh, the suffering in terms of the ideological assumptions or the backstory, that would affect. Um, there is a rationale that, well, it's unfortunate, but had to be done because the U.S. cause is correct, but still in all, because the actual suffering is so widespread and horrendous when the U.S. is at war of civilians, their suffering is so terrible. I think it would have some effect. I would say your point is very important that there's a, so to speak, empathy manipulation that is routine in U.S. media coverage. One way I've come to think about it is the fairly rigid, actually, in practice, imposition of encouragement of two tiers of grief, the grief that matters and the grief that doesn't. In U.S. media and politics, it's obvious which is which. 
The grief that matters is U.S. troops that die and injured and their loved ones. Now in the last more than 18 months, the suffering of Ukrainian civilians and soldiers. I don't per se have a problem with that at all. I think on the contrary, journalism and political leaders should encourage empathy and commiseration and connection with the grief of those who suffer from war. The very pernicious reality though, is that when it comes to people who lose their lives and then their loved ones, those who are injured because of US warfare, they're in the de facto other tier of grief. Essentially the message pretty much by omission of US media coverage is that they don't really matter. Most people are not of importance. Their grief is not even worth contemplating. That's a very corrosive, insidious, vicious media environment, political atmosphere that prevails in the United States. And while I can't say it's new, throughout the many past decades, uh, going back to wars uh, in mid-20th century, that's been the ongoing dynamic, but in many ways it's become worse, in part because the dominance of media is so pervasive, and despite the internet, media outlets are consolidated in terms of ownership. You know, 20 years ago, there were, oh, maybe 50 corporations that owned and controlled most of U.S. media reach through ownership. That number's down to about five now. So there's not a lot of gateways to reach a lot of people. And so I know your time is precious, so I'll ask you one more question then. Uh, try, and make, try and make it a little bit more upbeat. Is there a solution to this? What can we do about this? How can we fight back? Uh, are there good examples to follow? Uh, what should we be doing about this? Well, um, upbeat is good. Um, Antonio Gramsci, the great anti-fascist imprisoned by Mussolini, talked about the need for pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. So our optimism of the will can lead us to a lot of good places uh, on an ongoing basis. I, I, of course, believe that independence is crucial of media outlets. And we can't rely on, to put it mildly, the established big media institutions uh, any more than we can really rely on governments. I mean, I support and believe in what I have Stone, the great journalist, said, all governments lie and nothing they say should be believed. Stone wasn't saying all governments lie all the time. Uh, He was saying that we need a skepticism uh, all the time. Don't take anything for granted. Don't take anything on faith. And that's also true of uh, media outlets. And because of some of the dynamics that we've been talking about, the established big corporate owned or NPR, PBS type, corporate funded, corporate friendly uh, media organizations, uh, they have de facto uh, agendas per se and proclivities that require that we be skeptical. And as you know, Alan, uh, like you, I've written for and support FAIR, the Media Watch Group, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, encourage people to go to fair.org, not only a place to find media analysis, but to organize with others, a place for media activism to push back against, to analyze and challenge, including publicly media bias, established media institutions. And meanwhile, we need to build independent media outlets, progressive ones, online, TV, radio, film, poetry, writing, books, all the different ways, drama, the healthy ecology of culture that can resist and push back against uh, the warfare states that are so dominant and so destructive. So those are, of course, steep climbs, but I think support of independent media institutions and political organizing from the grassroots is essential. Uh, The corporate states, the uh, warfare states, they are well-organized. We need to be well-organized ourselves from the grassroots to create the kind of change that's needed. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. denounced what he called the madness of militarism 
We need antidotes to that madness in theory and in practice. And that needs to include organizing from the grassroots. Yeah, definitely. I would encourage everyone to check out fair.org and of course, mintpressnews.com. Uh, we've been talking to uh, Norman Solomon today. Norman, I would suggest everybody go out and check out your book, War Made Invisible. Is there anywhere else that uh, people can follow your work? Well, I'm at normansolomon.com and I post all of my articles up there. Um, and also, I really want to invite people to visit the activist group website where I work with, with colleagues, and that's rootsaction.org. You can get uh, sign up uh, for action alerts. We have 1.2 million people now who are signed up. So it's a way, again, to organize. We have a DIY Roots Action where you can actually uh, write up and propagate your own uh, petitions, and then you get access to people who sign the petitions. So you can do organizing that way. So encourage people, rootsaction.org, normansolomon.com. And also, uh, you can get more info about the book at warmadeinvisible.org. Thank you very much. That was Norman Solomon, everyone. If you've made it this far, I'm going to give a quick plug uh, for our Patreon. We are looking for all our viewers and uh, and listeners to support us if they can, and if they're in a financial position to do so. Do check out our Patreon uh, page there. If you if you Google Patreon Mint Press News, it'll come up, or there should be a link in the description down below. Uh, until next time, I'm Alan McLeod. You've been listening to the Mintcast on Mint Press News. Until then, stay fresh.